Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's noon, so why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Maggie Peters, and I'm an assistant professor here in the political science department. And I have the great honor of introducing David Layton today. Um, thank you all so much for coming. So this is the third and final Castle Lectures on Development in Africa, entitled A Search for Causes, Why Has Africa Been the Final Frontier? For this last lecture, instead of talking about all of David's great scholarly work, I wanted to talk about um, David as a mentor and his work in the profession as a mentor. Um, David's mentorship, I think, is particularly relevant to this lecture because it's on the causes, and no one scholar could ever hope to determine all the causes and all the effects of development or lack thereof, and so it takes an army of scholars to actually do this. Um, and David has mentored several people who are now working in this field. So I first met David as a first-year graduate student at Stanford when I took his comparative politics seminar. Um, having studied international relations in college, I had no idea who David Layden was, or like he was, you know, big and important in the field or anything like that. Um, and honestly, that, that first semester, David was quite terrifying because he seemed to know everything about everything. Like any time you brought up a point, he's like, no, actually this happened, and you're like, oh no, I, 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 don't, know what any, I don't know anything, I'm just a first year. Um, but what was great about that class is that he took our ideas really seriously. So when you made a logically coherent and you know, well-argued point, David actually took it seriously and engaged with it as a serious scholar would. Not just taking like, oh, you're a first year grad student, you don't really know what you're talking about, but instead really engaging with those ideas. Later that same year, I also had the opportunity to take his methods in comparative politics um, workshop in which each student proposed uh, a research project and we workshopped it throughout the quarter. I was really astonished by his enthusiasm for students' ideas and insights. He would express genuine excitement at the prospects of his students not only advancing his own work and the work of other scholars, but even overturning it. What I quickly learned, though, about David from this and other uh, interactions is that he takes the ideas of younger scholars quite seriously. <laughs> David is really the best kind of mentor, and he served on my committee, so I got to see this firsthand, because he actually believes he can learn from his advisees as much as they can learn from him. Just the other night at dinner, uh, so the last Wednesday we went out to dinner, he was discussing the work of one of his current crop of graduate students and her work in Africa, just as he would discuss any work of like any senior scholar, really engaging with it seriously and telling us how important it was and what a big contribution it would make to the literature. So this is one of the reasons um, I think that his work has remained so relevant and uh, important over time. He's continually eager to learn from his students, even as he shapes them into social scientists. And I believe that one of his most lasting legacies will be the army of scholars that he's developed, including myself. Um, and he has taught us to examine really big questions that maybe don't have easy answers or maybe don't have easy research designs, but are big and important for the, the world. And how to get at good quality research to try and get um, at those answers to those questions. So without further ado, here's David Leighton. Yipes. Thank you, Maggie. So the organization of the lectures, lecture one was on the unfulfilled dreams of African independence, where I took the goals of what the 1960 era would bring and showed that on three major dimensions, uh, that of economic development health, uh, of uh, social order, uh, and of democracy, uh, Africa did not move in the direction of other post-colonial uh, 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 regions or other regions of the world, but diverged from it. Uh, and uh, its development on these three dimensions uh, was nowhere close to the hopes uh, of the uh, founding uh, charismatic generation. Uh, lecture two, uh, I, s I think of as the symptoms uh, of uh, this failure uh, from the cultural, failed cultural project uh, of African personality, negritude, uh, to, uh, the, uh, 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 to the uh, breakdowns uh, of social order through uh, military rule, first by armies and then by personalist dictatorships and what personalism uh, has meant. Uh, so uh, the, uh, and third, uh, the levels of uh, corruption, uh, pre-bendalism, uh, the ownership of offices, uh, and how that has uh, uh, constrained uh, economic development. All of these were the symptoms uh, of this uh, failure of African dreams. 
And this lecture is a search for causes. Uh, why has Africa been uh, the final frontier? Uh, and uh, one slide uh, of an addendum with bringing some hope uh, after uh, a lecture of the causes of, uh, of, of the lag uh, in uh, development on these three outcomes. As I said in the end of the second lecture, uh, foreshadowing this one, uh, that uh, so far I've shown some associations, uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, between um, uh, African uh, uh, politics or processes uh, and its uh, failures on things we care about. Uh, but for establishing causes, you want to do something more. You want to show something uh, that's exogenous, where the putative cause cannot be influenced by the outcome to be explained. We need to show the putative cause was, in a sense, as if randomly uh, assigned uh, to say this was, a, uh, this was uh, an outside effect, a cause, which led to the effects uh, which Lecture 1 points to. Uh, and uh, from the literature, uh, I've basically parceled out eight different, you can call them storylines, narratives, uh, in which uh, we see uh, uh, some independent effect of each of these uh, uh, accounts uh, on some, at least some, or at least one uh, of the outcome uh, factors uh, that the first lecture pointed to. Uh, so just look it over, uh, and I will go one by one uh, through uh, these different accounts. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no literature out there which weighs uh, the particular magnitude of each of these effects, uh, nor uh, is there a literature uh, uh, which says which particular effect is related to which particular cause. So these are more generalized causal accounts for why Africa is on the final frontier. Uh, one of them... Uh, uh, was really, uh, you could say, uh, motivated uh, by some basic research by a Yale PhD uh, who then uh, had to go down the status ladder to teach at Princeton, uh, 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 Jeffrey Herbst. Uh, and he pointed out uh, that uh, African geography and demographic patterns uh, has had a big effect uh, on Africa being the last frontier. What he did was distinguish four kinds of demographic patterns across African states, uh, from difficult uh, uh, geographies, large countries with non-contiguous areas of high population density. Ten of the 38 countries which he examined uh, meet the criteria of difficult. Uh, hinterland countries, populations con concentrated in a very small area with the rest being sparsely uh, uh, large and sparsely populated, four of his 38 cases. Favorable uh, geographies, smaller countries with populations uh, concentrated around the capital, that's about half the countries, and then neutral, the residual for which he has no uh, uh, predictions. Uh, so let's look at these four different geographies. Here is the DRC, uh, which he calls difficult. You can see in the darker areas uh, high population density uh, with vast areas uh, uh, of extremely low density, uh, making it extremely difficult uh, to move from uh, or to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to transport from one major center to another. Uh, and from the point of view of Herbst, more so when we get to the uh, hinterland countries, that from the point of view of the colonial leaders, who try to govern these territories, or the independence leaders, the cost of getting to these other regions is higher than the returns of actually bringing order. So in a sense, from a rational perspective, bringing order to areas far from the capital city uh, is not going to yield you very much because, in a sense, sending um, uh, administrators out there and actually being able to oversee them uh, was too costly, uh, costly. Here comes the hinterland countries, um, and uh, example of Mauritania, and you see uh, the uh, tremendous possibility, as we'll see in a few moments, uh, that if you have small populations here that, uh, in a sense, recruit uh, uh, 
ethnic kin uh, for an insurgent army, actually getting out there uh, is no easy task. Uh, so let them, and the French did this, and um, the uh, independence leaders did this, is let them wallow in their poverty, and maybe uh, uh, we'll face some insurgency later on, but the cost of actually governing these areas uh, is too high. The favorable political geographies, an example of Benin, uh, is, uh, shows how relatively easy it is uh, to uh, go from south to north. Uh, populations are reasonably high all the way up, uh, and therefore uh, there's uh, the, co the cost of uh, sending administrators to the north of the country uh, is much lower uh, uh, than uh, 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 than it would be in the hinterland countries to its north. Uh, neutral political geographies, here's an example of Uganda for which we have nothing to say. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pattern here uh, of the uh, difficult terrains, the Sahel being the hinterland, uh, gives you a sense uh, that African geography has some con contigu contiguity uh, uh, across the different states. Uh, so what do we learn? Uh, and this is something that Herbst didn't do, but we're going to be doing more once we develop clear criteria for coding countries uh, on uh, this dimension of difficult uh, and, uh, and hinterland. Uh, basically, Her Why, how come the two countries are not code at all? because Herbst didn't code them, and we're developing coding criteria independent, uh, uh, independent of the peaking on the outcome variables, which I think Herbst did. Um, so, or he couldn't avoid doing. Uh, but now we have GIS data uh, uh, and satellite data, which is enabling us to develop clear coding criteria for every country in the world, uh, a project being done at, uh, amongst my graduate students now. So uh, if you look uh, here uh, at GDB per cap, uh, starting in 1960, uh, what you'll see is the, uh, it's the, uh, basically the hinterland countries uh, and, uh, and also uh, the, uh, here the neutral, uh, but it's the favorable geography countries which somehow have done a great deal better uh, in, uh, in GDP, GDP per growth. So you could say if you once put in um, uh, dummies for each of the uh, political geographies, uh, the, Afri the Africa effect on GDP growth would go way down. Uh, so you could say that having a bad geography, uh, rather than being in Africa, uh, uh, is, a, uh, is a causal factor. <coughs> what we find for uh, probability of civil war, uh, the difficult uh, terrains uh, are the ones that have the highest probability of a civil war. And the reason that, for that is you have these autonomous, largely populated areas outside the purview uh, of the capital city uh, that are better able to mount uh, an insurgency. Uh, so uh, difficult terrains are connected with the probability of civil war. And, uh, and this is uh, interesting work coming from another PhD student uh, at Stanford who's now at University of Pittsburgh, Lou Condra. What he did is he looked at, for all uh, ethnic groups in Africa, he took the center of where their population was and the distance from the capital city. And then he looked at the data from the minorities at risk and also ACLAD uh, for levels of rebellion and asked the question, what's the probability of rebellion based upon distance from the capital city? And in a sense, if you're in a difficult uh, um, uh, uh, or uh, difficult or a hinterland, uh, distance from the capital uh, is a very strong predictor uh, of uh, of the group being in rebellion against this ethnic group being in rebellion against the state, whereas in favorable and neutral geographies, there's no relationship of distance to the capital uh, and rebellion. So we're really seeing an effect of the inability uh, of, uh, of states to, uh, to bring, uh, you could call it uh, control uh, or governance uh, to areas that are very, very difficult to reach uh, given the peculiar nature, nature of African geography. Um, another aspect of geography, of course, is distance from the equator. Uh, and, uh, and what we find in distance from the equator, uh, as we're going to get to this later on when we talk about ethnic linguistic fractionalization, but right now 
we can just give you a simple graph uh, showing uh, that the average latitude of the country uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and the prediction uh, of uh, uh, the probability of malaria, uh, and that is to say uh, that uh, as you uh, are closer to the equator, the the uh, the, the uh, 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 the uh, probability of malaria, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of uh, contracting malaria, uh, goes up. Uh, so to sort of summarize this number one factor, difficult geography and proximity, proximity to the equator are associated with low growth, peripheral rebellion, and poor health. To use the language of statistics, it starts reducing the, Africa, the effect of the Africa dummy on growth equation. The work of Nathaniel, uh, Nathan Nunn on the slave trade uh, is remarkable. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, a set of historians who call themselves cleometricians, uh, Philip Curtin at University of Wisconsin was one of the leaders, uh, started doing censuses of the slave trade. Uh, and they had, these historians uh, had no right-hand side variables in mind and no left-hand side variables in mind. All they thought about was we want to know the facts of how many slaves there were and what ethnic groups they were. And uh, it looked something like this, uh, with a transatlantic slave trade of about 10 million slaves, an Indian Ocean of, uh, 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 of about a million, Trans-Saharan 3 million, Red Sea 1.3 million. Uh, and they not only were able to get the size of the, uh, the uh, slave trade, the magnitude of it, but also through all sorts of other records about facial, uh, 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 facial markings, they were able to get the ethnicity of the groups as well. Uh, or ethnicity of, uh, of the slaves as well, and get a pretty good idea of where they were from. And uh, it looks something like this, uh, with the numbers of, uh, uh, of today's of, of those countries didn't exist during the slave trade. But you were able to attribute where the slaves were from based upon their ethnicity and from where the port uh, uh, from which they were exported. And then the question is, what is the relationship? between high levels of uh, slave export in the country that exists today uh, um, uh, on things we care about today. Uh, and it turns out from amazing uh, statistical work done by Nathan Nunn and someone who taught here uh, for several years, uh, Leonard Wanchikan, uh, it turns out to be uh, pretty substantial. Uh, so what we find is that if you just take uh, the log slave exports over area of the country and just take those below and above the median number of slaves uh, and we look at average per capita income, what we see, astonishingly, uh, is a tremendous effect of the slave trade on post-independence growth. It says nothing about growth up to 1960. But after 1960, when Africans themselves were ruling, something happened which, which made the slave export countries uh, diverge from the, uh, from the non-slave export countries from, from the median, which is pretty astonishing. Uh, and there is a reversal of fortune. Uh, so if you, uh, uh, again, which is basically shows this by country, uh, that uh, the uh, higher the log, the higher uh, log exports, uh, the lower the uh, per capita income in 2000. But what's What's astonishing uh, is the paper with uh, Nunn and Wanchikan. One of the things we know from Afrobarometer, a survey instrument uh, used uh, periodically uh, through the African continent, a uh, number of African countries are associated, is they ask a, s a set of questions about do you trust uh, your relatives, do you trust your neighbors, do you trust the local council, and a generalized trust uh, question, in general, do you trust people? And what is astonishing is this is done across the whole world, that high levels of trust associate with better levels of public goods and higher growth. So the fact that we can go into a Toyota dealership and just show a piece of plastic and they're willing to accept it 
uh, lowest transactions costs uh, in the economy. Uh, and, um, and somehow, uh, this piece of plastic, on average, is, con is considered, <laughs> what is it con this guy probably does have the money to buy a thing. You look at the levels of trust uh, and, uh, uh, and um, uh, log exports, and what you see, the higher, the higher the level of exports, the lower levels of trust, which is sort of a causal factor for low levels of public goods and low growth. Uh, and this holds up when Nunn and Wanchikan send their articles to economics journals. Everyone says, this can't be true. I'm one of the reviewers myself and said this can't be true. Uh, and they have scores of, um, of uh, uh, estimations with everyone's uh, favorite omitted variable, and this thing holds up. Uh, why it's holding up and how a uh, few centuries later the effect s still holds is uh, something that we really don't understand, uh, but we have to try to understand uh, because the distrust, inherited distrust from the slave trade seems to have been uh, or seems to be an important factor in explaining why Africa is the last frontier. And it's certainly the slave trade at this magnitude distinguishes Africa from the other continents of the world. Third factor, partition. I love this next picture. This is a uh, developing uh, the Treaty of uh, Berlin uh, uh, in, um, uh, in 1884 and 1885. Uh, and uh, you can look at the ethnicity of the people who are dividing Africa, uh, and uh, you get a good sense of the local knowledge they had uh, when, uh, uh, when they made the boundaries of Africa. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get to this later, but I can't hold myself back now. Uh, Alberto Alcina has this wonderful uh, algorithm and says uh, that the, the percentage of the country's borders, that which are a straight line, are, an effect, are, are an indication that these borders were not endogenously developed based upon political power, but exogenously uh, imposed which means that the place is not real in the sense uh, of uh, having come from its own internal processes. Uh, and those of you who don't know Nevada uh, will appreciate, uh, uh, get a under better understanding. Uh, so the Berlin Conference from November 84 to 19 1885 to determine the boundaries, basically, of the Congo Free State, principally to prevent conflict amongst Europeans. That was the basic goal. Africa wasn't worth fighting over, uh, so let's get boundaries so we won't have to fight each other. And if you haven't read, uh, Africanists who haven't read uh, Robinson and Gallagher on, on this, Africa and the Victorians, uh, I strongly recommend it uh, to understand uh, imperialism from a different point of view uh, from the one uh, that uh, Lenin has suggested. Uh, the consequence was to lay down principles for the partition of Africa, and as you saw from the previous slide, uh, no African leaders were involved. One first-hand account, we've been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's feet have ever toured. I don't know what that means. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew exactly where the mountains and rivers and lakes were. This is quoted in this fabulous uh, paper uh, by Michalopoulos and Papanau uh, uh, in looking at the secondary effects uh, of the partition, something I rely upon. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the map uh, was divided more or less this way, but more interestingly, connected to the work of George Murdoch, uh, one of the greatest anthropologists uh, to have uh, worked with African material and here worked here at Yale, uh, was each of these colors represents uh, a different ethnic group uh, in, his, um, in his data set. And then superimposed on that is the boundaries of Africa uh, states today. Uh, and we see, uh, uh, as you'll see in a moment, no relationship whatsoever uh, to the uh, core areas of, uh, of ethnic uh, uh, 
uh, uh, homogeneity uh, and the actual uh, boundaries. Uh, if you go through the partition groups uh, from the Egba in Nigeria, Benin, and Togo, where at, uh, where at most 50% of their uh, homeland is in a single country, uh, that you can go down about 15 or 20 different ethnic groups, more or less at 50%, uh, to show how many groups have been divided in half uh, across of African uh, borders. I say at the end, for those of you who are political scientists, Africans, Africa's problems may be a gift to social science, allowing for really well-identified cross-border regression discontinuity designs, um, as exploited by Dan Posner uh, in looking at a group, uh, two groups separated uh, by uh, the Zambian and Malawian, uh, Malawi border, the Chewas and Tumbukus, uh, which uh, says uh, the Chewas and the Tumbukus have a different percentage of the overall population of their country in the two different countries. What's the effect of being a smaller or a larger minority on how they see themselves ethnically? It's a terrific paper in the American Political Science Review and a gift to us uh, from Berlin, 1884-1885. Very small gift. This comes basically from uh, Michalopoulos and Papanau's uh, uh, data, but you look at the groups that were not partitioned and uh, the groups that were partitioned, uh, and this looks at uh, armed conflict location and event data uh, project, the ACLED uh, project, um, and so it includes all violent events of ACLED, which is basically you need 25 people killed to get into ACLED, or an event to get into ACLED, uh, from 1997 to 2013. And what we see here is uh, a really uh, a nice table that the, uh, that the density, uh, where you're getting 20% uh, of uh, the 20% uh, uh, of the uh, non-partition groups uh, having no conflict uh, uh, or having no conflict in the ACLA database, but for the uh, but for the partition group, uh, that uh, only 8% have had no conflict. Uh, and you see uh, that the partition groups are much more likely to be in conflict uh, uh, with the state. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, uh, in a sense, uh, a direct, you can say, a direct effect uh, of a treaty uh, that did not involve uh, the local populations. Uh, and you could even say it's uh, causal uh, on conflict. If we look at development, uh, so we look at GDP per capita in uh, 205 uh, and uh, the, uh, the uh, percent population uh, in a partition group, and this is all countries in the world, uh, but in a sense, being partitioned uh, means, uh, uh, being partitioned means uh, uh, lower growth. So lower growth and higher conflict. Number four. Missionaries. This can be a surprising one. So, those of you who've read the first really great classic uh, of post, you can say, early independence uh, literature and Chinua Achebe's Things Fall <laughs> Apart, uh, although acknowledging the anti modern aspects of traditional religion, he saw the missionary activity as largely destructive of community integrity. Um, Max Weber, in his essay, now 110 years uh, old, in his Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism, would lead us to expect there was a treatment of Protestantism would have a positive value for growth. So can we judge between these two? I tell you, I'd rather read Achebe than Weber, but. Um, so we have, from work by Robert Woodbury and others, uh, we now have, uh, uh, from 1923, uh, missionaries per, per uh, 10,000 population. Um, and these are uh, from uh, just the Africa part of the sample. And we also know where they were located. And, excuse the humor in the second part of this, uh, but 
for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, basically uh, uh, per 10,000 population, 0.65. Uh, for the rest of the world, 1.13 uh, missionaries per 10,000. Uh, so they uh, were lower in sub-Saharan Africa, but we found out that they do like the beach, uh, that if you're an island country, uh, you uh, average two per 10,000 uh, uh, as opposed to uh, non-island 0.56. That's what happens when you s give a graduate student some data. Uh, <laughs> you, you get these irrelevant uh, uh, associations. <laughs> I couldn't take that one out, though. So what do we find uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the world? What you see is that the number of missionaries per cap in the world, but also in uh, Africa, uh, is associated with higher levels, uh, uh, with higher levels uh, of uh, secondary school enrollment, 1960-1985. So higher levels of human capital are associated uh, with higher levels of uh, missionary uh, presence. Uh, what about democracy? Woodbury makes this claim, which is sort of Weberian, uh, and that is that what the missionaries did, especially the Protestants, much more so than the Catholics, is they created newspapers and demanded literacy. Why did they demand literacy? Because the Protestants wanted the uh, 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 their adherents uh, to be able to read the Bible, uh, which th enabled them, the Africans who came out of missionary schools, uh, to start writing newspapers, uh, which were <laughs> largely critical of the, uh, of the colonial experience uh, and, uh, uh, and, in a sense, created a civil society, which is one of the foundations uh, for democracy. And so Woodbury uh, sort of um, uh, hypothesized that uh, post-independence, those who uh, were more exposed uh, to missionary experience uh, would, be, uh, uh, would be in countries uh, that would have uh, a, a higher polity score, that is, uh, be more democratic. Uh, and the data give limited support for this. And we could say this is partially exogenous, uh, that the Africans didn't invite uh, the, uh, uh, the missionaries there, although there was some bit of that uh, because uh, that where missionaries were shot at, they didn't go, uh, and where they were welcomed, uh, they, they stayed. And you could say where they were welcomed may be political cultures that were more cosmopolitan, uh, more open to their own education and change. Uh, so it's not as exogenous as one, uh, as a social scientist would want, uh, but there is, uh, th there is this association. And so we could say that in terms of human capital and democracy, the evidence suggests Africa suffered from a relative shortage of Protestant missionaries uh, rather than the destructive effect of the missionaries that Chinua Achebe uh, wants, uh, wanted us uh, to, uh, uh, to believe. Although I have to say that Achebe's novel is much more nuanced than that. Yeah, uh, so for those of, for the rest of you, what uh, Asimoglu and Robinson uh, point to is that where colonists uh, were most subject uh, uh, to disease, uh, uh, that in a sense, you didn't get the building of rule of law institutions. Uh, so ones which are most compatible for Europeans to impose their, um, their institutional project uh, uh, the, 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 uh, in a sense, the greater, uh, the, greater the, the, uh, uh, the development. So you have what they call uh, the reversal of fortune, uh, those places where, uh, like North America, where, uh, where Europeans could survive, uh, you get extremely 
uh, strong institutions, uh, those uh, which they had more difficult surviving in, uh, say, uh, West Africa, uh, you get, uh, you in a sense, get, you allow, you allow the locals to, to um, oppress their own populations, don't impose uh, European institutions, uh, and you get worse outcomes. Uh, this is a uh, highly controversial in the field, uh, uh, in, lar <laughs> in large part because they actually never showed you the institutions that were being built. So they're only hypothesized institutions, but this is a long debate. The colonial state. I think I said in the first lecture uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the colonial state is often pointed to as the culprit and colonialism as the culprit for all that went bad. But it's extraordinarily difficult to actually identify the effect of the colonial state if everyone had it. <laughs> uh, and what is it about the colonial state? What are the mechanisms of the colonial state? And once you start looking at this carefully, the colonial state existed, let's say, from 1885 to 1960. It wasn't like the whole history of Africa. Uh, and, uh, and, and so, in a sense, uh, great books uh, uh, like uh, Crawford Young's uh, uh, book on the, on the African colonial state uh, describe all, describe some of the worst excesses of, of colonialism, but can't identify what those excesses excesses were on outcomes uh, we care about. So one we could see if Liberia and Ethiopia are substantially different without having been without having fully experienced colonial rule by uh, European states. Uh, but it's hard to get inferential le leverage from two cases out of uh, fifty some some odd uh, and. Uh, and to the degree to which you could say Ethiopia and Liberia were not really colonized, well, that's an ambiguous uh, kind of claim to make. And no one is taking uh, a Liberia or Ethiopia dummy variable and saying, you see, there was no effect of colonialism. Second, you can reconstruct the counterfactual through pre-colonial state building trends in Africa. And I'm going to do that for the next couple of slides. Uh, and the third point uh, I'll, uh, I'll get back to in a few minutes. Uh, so. This is something that really doesn't have any good uh, statistical uh, 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 sort, of, uh, s sort of support, but I think there's something to it uh, going uh, back to uh, work uh, of Richard Reed with a military revolution in 19th century proto-states were all in the making. And Reed says, looking throughout the African continent uh, uh, in a wonderful book, uh, points out that there was a military revolution in Africa in the mid-19th century where proto-states were in the making. That is, those groups that could project power were actually creating units which were state-like. And you see in the Dahomey, Ashante, Ibadan in West Africa, the rise of the Bunyoro state in today's Uganda, the Ngoni and Zulu armies conquering new territories in South uh, Africa, and Uthman Danfodio building a large, effective caliphate in Sokoto in northwestern Nigeria. And his causal conjecture was that the colonial authorities, and classic amongst them Lord Lugard, who served uh, as, uh, uh, as colonial, uh, 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 what is it, uh, uh, colonial governor in Uganda and in Nigeria, his basic idea was the way to govern these territories was to find people who had high legitimacy, that is chiefs, and give them salaries, that is give them authority, to keep the peace. And instead of banking on the emergent state, military state uh, uh, units, which were largely trans-ethnic and highly uh, 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 merit-based, you went back to traditional based leaders and gave them the support to rule over areas. And in a sense, this undermined the, um, the enormously creative uh, state building processes of the 19th century and created a bunch of states whose, made, whose leaders had an interest in the status quo. So the, the causal conjecture is the colonial authorities sought control in the cheap and reinstalled traditional leadership 
Oyo over Ibadan, for example, uh, because Ibadan didn't have a great king, uh, but it had the best army, uh, and you support, you support the most legitimate king rather than the most authoritative army. And this brought order at the, exp at the expense of dynamic development. The third way to look at, uh, uh, identify the effect of colonial state on post-colonial African development is to ask whether is, th there is a single colonial effect, what Crawford Young calls Bula Matari, the colonial state as a crusher of stones. Bula Matari is sort of the uh, metaphor throughout uh, Crawford Young's book, or whether we can leverage differences in the colonial experience to see if the type of colonial rule had a causal effect on development outcomes. So let's look at the returns to the luck of assignment at the Treaty of Berlin. It's not so much luck. Chris will get me on this one. So if you look at doctors per capita, uh, university education, and um, uh, that uh, where would you rather be, <laughs> who would you rather be ruled by uh, here, uh, the average primary plus secondary, uh, uh, Portugal uh, wins out, but that's almost all uh, on primary and almost none on secondary. Uh, so if you look at s secondary over primary, Britain would be uh, uh, way on top again. So in the creation of a, of a governing elite, uh, you could say also a medical elite, and we saw some of the effects of the medical elite in the Ebola crisis where Nigeria, which can't put down an insurgency in the Northeast, uh, uh, the, medical, uh, the medical profession was trusted uh, in ways that did not occur in, um, in Sierra Leone and uh, in Liberia. Uh, for uh, infrastructure, phones, uh, railroads per square mile, and vehicles, again, uh, uh, again Britain does uh, extremely uh, better in, uh, in basic infrastructure. Civil war within three years of independence. What we find is that uh, Belgium, two out of three, uh, Portugal, two out of five, and France and Britain, uh, practically none. And here's a case where institution, well, I have to take a step back. Viren and I uh, basically asked uh, the question from a statistical point of view uh, that whether are the factors associated with civil war onset post-1945. And one of the robust um, uh, variables that are, you could call predictors, although we had no causal identification, uh, was whether the country was independent within the past three years. And early independence was a big predictor. Basically, from a fear on point of view, uh, that uh, minorities, when a country becomes independent, minorities face a difficult dilemma, that they're likely to be oppressed by the new majority, uh, but the new majority won't oppress them until they're strong enough to do so. It takes a few years to be able to, uh, to get your army to uh, be able to um, oppress. Uh, so you have a small window of two or three years to get the hell out of that country. <laughs> and so in a sense, uh, like the, you can think of the classic case of the Serbs in the uh, Ukraina in, um, in, in uh, Croatia, uh, that before the Croats, figure out how to get rid of the Serbs, uh, you might as well try to get your independence early. So in a sense, uh, the first two or three years are ones uh, where the state is the weakest, uh, and uh, the state is the weakest, and the opportunities for rebellion, uh, therefore, the greatest. And what you find uh, is in Africa uh, that the French and British armies didn't leave and help protect the new leadership in those early years. But when Portugal and Belgium got out, they got out. In the 1940s, in the sense, in, the, in the, 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 with the Ottoman Empire, the Brits got out as fast as they could uh, for both India and in the uh, Middle East, with the same effects of the first two years being disastrous. So in a sense, Britain and France were stronger uh, colonial powers, able to uh, manage a transition uh, uh, to independence much better uh, than uh, the other colonial leaders. If you look at economic growth, and this 
connects to the uh, investments in infrastructure and education. Uh, each line is a different country. Uh, you see uh, that uh, Britain outpaced uh, uh, Belgium, Portugal, and France, uh, except uh, for, I believe, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that's Gabon. Back to Robinson, sorry, back to Ashimoglu and, uh, uh, and Robinson. If you look at legislative institutions, that is, the number of years before independence that you had a legislative council, that you had native representative in the legislative council, or you had elected native representation in uh, legislative council, what we see is that the UK, uh, that is, uh, uh, sorry, that UK uh, 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 starts earlier, has more countries with earlier uh, uh, um, legislative institutions. This is uh, Senegal, uh, which is uh, very early uh, for the, at least the four communes of uh, Senegal. Uh, so in a sense, early institutional development, early infrastructural investment uh, paid off uh, for uh, UK colonies. And if we look at the regime type, uh, we see uh, that on the polity score, uh, uh, that uh, on average, uh, being a colony of Britain uh, pays off or paid off uh, not only for economic growth, uh, but, for, um, uh, but for democracy. Uh, so all colonial states, to achieve order, undermine the state-building gains of Africa's military revolution. That's yet to be demonstrated, uh, but uh, the historical work suggests that hypothesis. But once colonized, I say fewer stones were crushed or more seeds planted under British colonial rule. Cultural diversity. I explained earlier what ethno-linguistic fractionalization, or earlier lecture, what ethno-linguistic fractionalization means. Uh, it is if you take two people randomly from any country, uh, the probability they will have a different, call it ethno-linguistic heritage. Um, and it's a dispersion index. Uh, that if those of you who want to do the arithmetic, uh, that's the uh, algorithm. Uh, but that will basically get you from, uh, from uh, zero, which says uh, that the zero probability someone will be of a different ethnic group, to 0.99, a 99% chance uh, that two people will be of different ethnic groups. Uh, that would be hard to achieve, uh, or uh, no one would be able to communicate with one another. Uh, so uh, this. This uh, ELF, ethnic linguistic fractionalization, has been pointed to by uh, several economists, uh, and it goes, uh, uh, it goes again and again uh, in the literature uh, that Africa's growth tragedy uh, is associated with high levels of ethno-linguistic fractionalization. Uh, so if you look uh, at, uh, uh, at ELF and latitude, what we find <laughs> is ELF, uh, uh, in a sense, is, is predicted by latitude. And that's something, uh, if you read the literature on, um, uh, on uh, sort of um, uh, ecology, you find it's exactly the same for all plant species and all animal species. The closer you are to the equator, the more, diver the, the more ecological diversity you get. And it, it, fits, it fits linguistic variation just about perfectly. Uh, although no one has an, uh, a clue uh, as to why. Uh, and also, so it, it may be the ELF factor may be confounded, confounded uh, by latitude. And also, in an amazing paper by uh, Stelios uh, Michalopoulos, uh, it also uh, is associated with soil diversity. That what he does is looks at soil, Michalopoulos does, he looks at soil diversity by made-up country. Uh, he calls them virtual countries. He divides the world up into squares, or is it squares or rectangles? I forget, but something like a square, and then looks at the degree to which there is soil diversity in that square, and then looks at ELF within that square, and then looks at production in that square, and finds 
that once you put soil diversity, the effect of ethnic linguistic diversity disappears. Remarkable paper. Uh, so in, th in other words, the exogeneity of ELF has, not, has been slowly undermined by recent research. Nonetheless, I think there's something still to be told about ELF, but not a whole lot. And let me show you why not a whole lot from work that I've done with Firon. This is going to be somewhat unreadable, but I'll try my best to explain what this is, but it's in uh, 203 American Political Science Review. Here we have on the x-axis GDP from poor to rich. Here we have degree of ethnic homogeneity, high, low. And uh, this is the proportion, a share of the largest cultural group. It's not really a ELF, it's the size of the largest ethnic group. But the same thing would occur. And let's take, uh, uh, let's take the uh, relatively, um, uh, uh, the, the relatively, uh, uh, the proportion of ethnic group. If you're, uh, if you're poor, uh, the these are all the probabilities of a civil war onset over a five-year period. So over a five-year period, uh, it's 0.14 here, 0.18. It goes up slightly uh, as you get more, for poor countries, uh, as you get more homogeneous. Here, if you're a rich country, it actually goes down. And there's no consistent pattern uh, of the, uh, the uh, uh, no consistent pattern at any level of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, GDP uh, uh, for the probability of uh, civil war. But if you go this way and say, as you go, say, at uh, near 100% uh, of the uh, one ethnic group, the richer you get, start up at 0.3 down to zero. For highly heterogeneous groups, 0 0.4, 0 0.12, 0 0.005, 0 0.002. So in a sense, ethnic heterogeneity does not predict civil war onset. One of the big findings of the research I've done with Biron uh, is that, uh, uh, is that uh, the capability of the state as, uh, as indicated by uh, or as proxied by, uh, by uh, GDP uh, is washes out uh, uh, ELF uh, washes out any ethnic kind of uh, algorithm uh, or, or percentage uh, in predicting uh, civil war. Similarly, with low levels of conflict, you get a slightly, slightly positive uh, coefficient uh, that holds up in most um, uh, uh, econometric specifications, uh, but is somewhat fragile, uh, that as ELF goes up, that is, as you have more fractionalization, you get slightly more, um, uh, uh, slightly more a probability of low-level conflict, 25 deaths. So there's some relationship to violence uh, and ethnic uh, uh, heterogeneity, but not a whole lot. We know from the world, however, that ethnic fractionalization uh, uh, is associated with lower GDP, but that isn't well identified. That's merely uh, association which may be torn apart once you look at diversity of soil quality uh, or, uh, or distance uh, from the equator. So the Easterly Levine finding about ELF and Africa's growth tragedy is not entirely convincing. But if you just take ELF and ask What's the effect of ELF on the delivery of public goods? That is, things uh, in which uh, everyone collectively has to uh, pay for and anyone collectively can enjoy. Uh, that is, goods like a good school system uh, or a lighthouse uh, or a wells for the whole community. And here we're getting some real uh, uh, traction for ELF. And this is a work uh, by uh, Miguel and Cougarty in, uh, in Kenya. I gave some of this material uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the second lecture. Uh, but basically, what they do is in, uh, in uh, Busia, in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in western uh, Kenya, they take each school district or each small district and code it as to how diverse it is. 
That is, there are two or three different uh, ethnic groups in Western uh, Kenya which haven't moved for 100 years because of British uh, policy not uh, uh, prohibiting uh, a movement of populations for a long time. So in a sense, the, uh, the diversity of the population, they argue, is exogenous. That is, uh, people would have moved to richer areas if they could have, but they couldn't under the colonial system. And so in Busia, what you have are relatively stable uh, ethnic uh, 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 proportions for a long time. And then what they do is they look to see on two outcomes which are public goods. One, uh, 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 contributions to the school system. Without these sort of uh, voluntary contributions, the school systems would have almost no materials. And these are called harambe, uh, uh, let us pull together, uh, harambe uh, school donations. Second, there was a Finnish, F Finnish, from Finland, a project of building wells throughout this whole region. Um, and, uh, and the Finns built in, this, in a few places in the region, uh, places where you can get spare parts and repairs. And what they found, what they wanted to ask is, for these two public goods, school system and well maintenance, well maintenance, in the sense, is a public good because you can't exclude anybody from it, and in the sense, uh, it's not rival, uh, that is, anyone who uses it does not stop the next person from gaining from it. So they're, they're actual true public goods. And what they find is that uh, areas with average uh, ethnic linguistic fractionalization are six percentage points less likely to have a functioning well than homogeneous areas. And of course, they control for how, how far away you are from Lake Victoria uh, and uh, all sorts of other factors which might have intervened here uh, to, uh, if you can get, if you're close enough to the lake you, and the well doesn't work, instead of going to get it repaired, you can go to the, you can go to the lake. Uh, so all of these things were controlled and still a big effect of ethnic heterogeneity on well maintenance uh, and for local school funding, average local school funding uh, uh, with average ELF uh, is 20% less than in homogeneous areas. So people are less willing uh, to, uh, uh, to act for the community to the degree to which the community is ethnically diverse and Africa's therefore high ethnic diversity is having an independent, an independent effect on uh, low, low levels of the production of public goods. Why is this? Um, on ethnic exclusion, actually the jury is still out. Um, there's not much evidence uh, that ethnic exclusion is doing the work that the Luyas are keeping the Tessos uh, uh, from their schools uh, or, uh, or anything of that sort. Uh, Differing pre preferences? No, you do a survey, and you find that everyone wants the well to work. They all want someone else to do it, though. Um, and they all want better schools. So it's not like some have suggested uh, that ethnic heterogeneity, uh, you can't agree on anything because people want different things, but most people want better schools and wells that work. Uh, what about inability to coordinate? There's mixed evidence on this, uh, that if you speak a different language uh, uh, and uh, that uh, you have different social networks, it's harder to, in a sense, reach agreements uh, with people who speak different languages, even though Swahili may be an inter a way to, or English may be a way to, uh, 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 to mediate this. Uh, but uh, that, uh, that inability to coordinate seems not to be a big effect on other research throughout uh, Africa, uh, and a great book on co-ethnicity uh, uh, by Habi Ramana uh, and others uh, shows uh, only the inability co to coordinate has a small effect, whereas these first two have no effects. It's this one which uh, Miguel finds for his Busia research uh, and Habi Ramana and all find in their research in Uganda. And that is what they call weak monitoring. And that is that if you're a uh, principal of a school, uh, how can I, I can make a Yale analogy here or something, uh, that th those of you who are undergraduates will soon find uh, that your common Yale identity will be appealed to every year uh, as, they, as they beg you for money. Uh, and, <laughs> and what's interesting about this is they, at least where uh, the, a similar school where I was uh, uh, educated, uh, 
they have a class president whose job is to humiliate you if you haven't given. <laughs> and there are various humiliation strategies. Uh, uh, and uh, one of them, of course, is to list the people who are on the honor honor, what is it called, uh, code, or whatever that is, who've given more than a certain amount of money. And you look to see, oh, this person has given a lot, and you see your name way down there, and you're humiliated. And you think, what's the least I can give to not be humiliated? <laughs> <laughs> My father used to do that with a UGA, JA, so I knew the strategy very well. So, um, so that if you're in the school, suggests Miguel and Cougarty, uh, and there are different ethnic groups. Humiliation is dangerous. People may think they're, you're doing it to them because you're a Tesso, and not because you're a laggard in payment. It could lead to all sorts of misunderstandings, uh, and that we find in experimental games throughout Africa uh, that the degree to which you're being watched by a member of your own ethnic group leads to higher levels of, uh, of support for public goods. And in a sense, being watched by someone from another ethnic group does not have the same effect. So in a sense, there is, a, uh, there is a, in a sense, weak monitoring in, uh, of, weak monitoring in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, giving of, uh, of support for public goods, uh, the, the, the weaker monitoring, the degree to which there is ethnic linguistic fractionization. So for cultural diversity, Africa's diversity, in part through the latitude, soil diversity, and through the partition, I think still has an independent effect, maybe on low-level violent conflict, maybe on growth, but I think, importantly, on public goods. Yikes. War. And Charles Tilley. Charles Tilley's famous states make wars and wars make states has implications for post-colonial state building in Africa. The colonial wars were fought in Africa appear to be reverse from Tilley. The wars were undermining future state building. And I'm going to argue the OAU, Organization of African Unity Bargain, sustains what Jackman and Rosberg called juridical states whose leaders do not have sufficient incentive to build de facto states. So this cool thing comes from my collaborator, Jim Fearon, uh, on the four types of wars in this Carolus of War data set, non-state wars fought by tribes or ethnic groups uh, uh, within countries, intra state wars, which are civil wars, extra-state wars, uh, which are imperialist wars, and interstate wars, wars between states. What we basically find in this graph uh, is that there was a reversal in the second half of the 20th century. First half of the 20th century, the, about five deaths uh, uh, to interstate war for one death in uh, intrastate wars in reverse uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the second half of the 20th century where almost all the deaths are uh, intrastate wars. And here in the mid and late 19th century, you have a whole number of these extrastate wars which are largely wars uh, uh, of imperial conquest. So we have different types of wars, and we can ask the Tilly question, what types of wars are associated with state building, and what types of wars are associated uh, with state undermining? And in research that's still in progress uh, that I'm doing with Firon, we look at from two data sets, correlates of war, and this guy, Paul Brecka, who is now a dean at Georgia State University, who went back to the 1400s and have coded every type of war in every continent uh, for how many centuries is it to back to the 14th? We've only gone back to 1815. And the key finding is what predicts post-Civil War civil conflict years, the number of years a country is in war post-1945. And with a whole number of controls, Pre-45 imperialist conflict years is a predictor of post-45 civil war years. The effect is not gigantic, but it's, but it's statistically significant and substantively important. And you could say fighting imperialist wars, in a sense, were state undermining. 
I'll give you one example. Uh, so when the Suez Canal was built, uh, uh, Aden, which is now in the news quite regularly, uh, became a coaling station for the Brits, but the Brits couldn't get any meat from there. Uh, and they found they could get meat from Berbers, uh, that is from, uh, from nomads in, uh, in Somalia, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, su to supply uh, the coaling station. Uh, and basically, nomads would come up from the Ogaden area here uh, to, uh, to today's Berbera uh, and sell their goats and even camels, uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and that would go off to Aden. Uh, and then there was a religious guy here, Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, uh, who, uh, who saw this as the end, the end of, uh, uh, of Somali culture and also the end of uh, Islamic uh, he thought that the missionaries would come and turn them all into Christians. And he fought a 21-year war uh, against the Brits. It was only after World War, it started in 1899, and it was, not after, it was only after World War I where the Brits used uh, hit, uh, uh, their warplanes to bomb his, uh, uh, his center in Talah, uh, in today's Ethiopia. Uh, it was a 21-year 21 21 war where the Ogaden, uh, uh, center, mostly Darod Ogaden, uh, were fighting with Muhammad Abdul Hassan, and the Brits basically hired the Isaks over here, the trading groups here, uh, to fight in their armies. So we had two armies that developed over 21 years. And you could say that this imperialist war is an example of an imperialist war giving what we would call the conflict capital in uh, Somalia to be able to kill each other once they were independent. The Organization of African Unity uh, is uh, another, you could say, uh, state, building, uh, uh, state building problem with the problem of what Rosberg and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and Jackman call juridical states. As many of you know, the Organization of African Unity uh, from 1963 to 202 uh, basically made an agreement and that is to defend their sovereignty, their territorial integrity, and their independence. This third point was, uh, uh, this third point was the key. Uh, and, and that in many ways it's been argued uh, that Africa's civil wars can be considered state-building wars. Uh, can Africa's civil wars be considered state-building wars, wars in the Tilly sense? Uh, but now I'm treading on uh, Nicholas's territory, so uh, I'm a little nervous here. But about 30% of Africa's civil wars do not reward the side that has been best projected power with the right to rule, thereby undercutting the Tilly mechanism of how wars make states. This, this point, political scientists sardonically call, give war a chance. Uh, uh, if, if you allow uh, the... The, the, in a sense, the institutional unit uh, to, uh, uh, that's most able to project power, to actually take power, you might be able to get states which, in, in a sense, can rule over their own periphery. So consider the influence of the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations and its successful, according to the really terrific work of Doyle and Sambanis. And Michael Doyle, who gave the lectures a few years before me, has actually consolidated this into a terrific book, uh, what they call multidimensional peacekeeping missions. And what we find is if we look at center-seeking civil wars and autonomy-seeking civil wars, that basically 23% of the uh, center-seeking civil wars and 30% of the uh, autonomy-seeking civil wars end up with a kind of Kofi Annan-type uh, uh, reconciliation uh, of, of power sharing. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, <laughs> tons of lives were saved uh, through this intervention uh, of basically the United Nations Department of Peacekeeping Operations. Uh, but you might say uh, that although they find pretty convincingly that these uh, multi-dimensional peacekeeping and peacebuilding processes do hold back war uh, for a significant period. That is, they're life-saving. Uh, what you need to show is their state-building. 
And one could argue uh, that the uh, UN system, uh, uh, which is so successfully saving lives, may be undermining the Tilly effect of war making states. So we could say from the imperial uh, uh, in the 19th century to cauterize civil wars in post-independence, many of Africa's wars have not been state building, but have been state undermining. I'm almost finished. Economic doctrines. What I want to argue here is you could say that Africa's independence of the early 1960s just coincided with reigning economic doctrines and a Cold War, uh, which had a big effect on economic policy on the negative side. Bad timing, you could say. African socialism uh, was one of three fateful influences distorting economic incentives. The notion of import substitution industrialization, reigning at the time as the way to develop, uh, had uh, consequences which were quite uh, uh, harmful for development, and then foreign aid in the Cold War era. So at a dinner, as I mentioned in question and answer in the first lecture, in Nkrumah's honor during his visit to Cote d'Ivoire, a few years before Cote d'Ivoire is independent, Houphoué Boigny, the future president of Cote d'Ivoire, offered this challenge at the dinner. A wager has been made between two territories, one having chosen independence, the other preferring the difficult, <laughs> difficult road to, construct, to the construction with a metropole of a community of men in equal rights and duties. Let us each undertake his experiment in absolute respect of the experiment of his neighbor, and in 10 years, in 10 years, we shall compare the results. Yeah. There. No, just go to the results. Oh, I should say here. Country, the countries were neighbors with similar resource endowments with potential in cash crops, cocoa and coffee. They were dominant, culti dominant cultivators with smallholding peasants. The big differences were the economic policies of implementation at the time of independence, Ghana's socialism, Cote d'Ivoire's accommodation to world capitalism. So it was a nice experiment that Houphoué had, uh, had given to us uh, with, with his wager. And Krumah was the loser. <laughs> CIV is Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and although it started off with, uh, in 1960 with lower GDP per cap, uh, then uh, Ghana uh, was the loser. But African socialism, or the idea of socialism, was so attractive in 1960 uh, as, an, in a sense, uh, uh, the reason why the Soviet Union, the reason why China was able to catch up was because of state socialism. And the only voice negative was an American economist, Elliot Berg, who basically said, for socialism to work, you actually need a very effective state being able to do Leontief uh, 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 kind of matrix algebra uh, and being able to organize a uh, state uh, with enormously uh, committed and well-educated uh, 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 bureaucracy. Uh, and without that, there's no way to, do the to implement the five-year plans uh, which would make that the, the, the uh, Soviet Union relevant. Uh, but Elliot Berg uh, got into the American Economic Review, uh, but uh, not much else. Uh, and you could look at uh, Botswana, because when Botswana becomes independent, everyone is laughing uh, at them uh, for, uh, for giving up entirely uh, the socialist idea, uh, making fun of it, uh, and it's been the fastest growing state in Africa. So being, in a sense, on the, the, wrong, the, wrong, the wrong side of history when the reigning economic doctrine uh, was rather uh, harmful. Uh, the World Bank, as Easterly has shown, uh, had their own ideas about what brought about economic development. And as Easterly points out in a book about five years ago, uh, that uh, World Bank for 40 years was unwilling to update uh, uh, the fact that its prescriptions were working negatively rather than positively. Uh, but Raoul Prebiche uh, of the Economic Commission for uh, Latin America pushed this uh, key to development, this quick moving out of raw material dependence and the best industrial 
policy is to manufacture goods that meet domestic demand through substitution. Why did ISI fail? The economic doctrine of the 1960s supported policies that taxed the peasantry in order to build manufacturing that would substitute for imports. Uh, in Ghana, what taxing the peasantry meant uh, was in marketing boards, you underpaid the peasants uh, for their uh, cocoa. And what did the peasants do? Uh, they just uh, moved to Ivory Coast and sold it there, uh, enhancing Hufwe's um, uh, uh, tax base. Uh, and undermining Ghana's. The low wages in the new industries, though, in order to make your import substitution work, you had to uh, have low wages. But the way you supported that was exchange rate policies, which overvalued local currencies. But once you do that, as Bates's work shows, these policies undermined agricultural sectors who couldn't, in a sense, uh, be, be supported uh, or buy anything uh, 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 from their agricultural uh, gains, uh, and it created non-competitive manufacturing sectors, which were completely supported uh, by the phony exchange rate. Economic doctrines in the 1960s facilitated underdevelopment in Africa. Let me say something about the Cold War. I'm going to give you two slides, one from Vreeland and Dreher, and one from uh, Desha Girod. The African Development Bank pre-1982 was basically internally funded in Africa. After 1982, it got funds from the OECD states, the rich states. Uh, and what we find, uh, to make a long story short, is if you were a United Nations Security Council member pre-1982, it had no relationship whatsoever to how many grants or how much funding you got from the Development Bank. But Post-1982, suddenly, if you were on the Security Council, it didn't matter <laughs> what the value of your project, uh, the African Development Bank was sensitive. And what Vreeland and Dreher do is say, let's take the years in which there were crucial votes in the Security Council, which of course is exogenous to anything Africans would be interested in, uh, and it finds out that this coefficient is even more powerful. So in a sense, Foreign aid was going for licking the behinds of the uh, uh, of Western uh, Western countries rather than uh, for projects which were, in a sense, economically viable. Uh, under the George W. Bush uh, years, uh, they developed this millennial uh, 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 development fund where they tried to uh, eliminate this variable, are you voting with the United, Nation, United States and the Security Council, and try to say institutional development uh, uh, and institutional um, uh, integrity was going to be the key to whether you get any money. Uh, this, this program has been extremely difficult to, uh, to implement, uh, and it's still one where the jury is out whether it has any uh, return. Uh, what we find from the work of Deshik Gerard uh, is that um, that if you just look at non-strategic aid, that is non-military aid, and changes in uh, infant mortality, uh, that, that countries with bad institutions, that is, who get most of their money from oil or uh, other windfalls, bad institutions, the, uh, in a sense, uh, the aid has zero effect uh, on things we care about, in this case, uh, uh, um, in this case, uh, uh, infant mortality. It's only uh, the countries that have had to build decent institutions uh, in which the aid has worked. So you could say aid policies uh, going to countries uh, which are not building uh, institutions uh, in the sense uh, which is basically a Cold War, kind of a Cold War effect, uh, has had a big effect in rewarding countries for kissing the behind of the OECD uh, rather uh, than building institutions uh, that would uh, enhance their development. So the economic disincentives to growth, socialism without a state apparatus to manage an economy, this is Elliot Berg's point, import substitution uh, uh, disincentivizes agriculture and supports inefficient industry, and foreign aid goes to Western clients with no incentive to make that aid work. Uh, so you could say the economic doctrines and the Cold War had an independent effect uh, on uh, Africa's uh, development. So the eight causal accounts, geography and demography, the slave trade, the partition, missionaries, the colonial state, 
ELF, of cultural diversity, international support of juridical states, and the prevailing economic doctrines in Cold War at time of independence. Uh, this is as much as we know uh, to explain why Africa uh, has lagged uh, the rest of the world in development in, uh, in uh, after uh, optimistic, the optimistic moment of uh, the early 1960s. Uh, I can't stop there. There are manifold causes for the dysfunctional politics in Africa post-independence, uh, but people can remake their own histories. And indeed, there are some hopeful signs that Africa has already begun turning a corner. 20 years of democracy in multiracial South Africa uh, that uh, in my generation, no one believed that post-apartheid South Africa would be both democratic uh, and, um, and functioning. Uh, the, not that they don't have problems, but it's a functioning and, and established democracy. Uh, that's a, one of the great achievements, I think, uh, of the end of the 20th century. Uh, there's trends of better scores on transparency, executive constraints throughout Africa, the two keys uh, to, uh, in a sense, predicting economic growth, both predicting better property rights and stronger growth. Economies of sub-Saharan Africa grew at a strong pace of 4.5% a year on average during the 1995 to 2013, even though per capita income growth was modest uh, at around 2%, uh, but still, uh, compared to the 1980s and uh, early 1990s, uh, Africa has clearly turned a corner. Malaria and measles, even though they haven't reached uh, levels uh, that the rest of the world has achieved, uh, as I showed in the first lecture, uh, the road, we're on the road to extinction uh, of these uh, diseases in Africa. So Africa remains, uh, uh, e even with these hopeful signs, Africa remains as the world's final frontier. While there have been examples of progress, I believe it is up to next generations of Africans and friends of Africa to bring to their populations the quality of life and governance that's the right of all people. Thank you very much. That literature is one which is creating every paper comes out more ambiguity. Uh, but I will say that people have asked the question, why, why diamonds in Sierra Leone versus diamonds in Botswana? And so the standard answer amongst Africanists or people who study this thing is Sierra Leone has these alluvial diamonds. Uh, which means that anybody <laughs> with a small militia can, in a sense, harvest it. Uh, and therefore, you have uh, these shadow states with shadow militias, each, each having established uh, sort of rights uh, uh, or property rights to exploitation uh, of these alluvial fields. Whereas Botswana, it's deep down 
with high capital investment uh, and therefore can't be stolen every day by a small, a small militia. So it was a luck that you needed uh, uh, high, high capital investment there. But to actually think in the terms of, uh, well, Kivu is rich in, rich in diamonds, that means, this, sorry, rich in a bunch of minerals, which means you have Rwanda and Uganda uh, and uh, Kinshasa uh, uh, all seeking out control over this region. Uh, but we did some research and said, on this question and said, if you can find areas which have high value, is it more likely people will be fighting over it over the past 150 years? And we couldn't find any relationship. So it's still in the air. Going down the road, the thing that I want to worry about is you know, this problem of the demographic uh, bulge, this high youth population or the percentage of the population that just can't find jobs, you know, the standing around or waiting around or sitting around generation, that'll really be problematic for the system if they cannot find you know, economic success in their own lives. I'm wondering how that'll play out. I, Sam Huntington came out with this youth bulge paper some, what, 20 years ago or something. And it's a great idea, except I've seen no support for it. <laughs> I've, that, that unemployment is endogenous to uh, other factors. Uh, and, and you could think that Japan's growth would be much greater if, in fact, it had some of those youth. Uh, so in a sense uh, uh, that if you have a dynamic economy, youth is a really good thing. Uh, uh, but we find, uh, we find no evidence of of youth bulge on the probability of civil war or uh, on, on anything that we absolutely care about. Uh, and so I still see it in the newspapers all the time. People like Tom Friedman write about it every two weeks. Uh, but but I, actually don't, I, have, I actually have not seen empirical support for it. Well, that makes it hard to test. Chris? Yeah, I have a question about, I, I thought you were going to talk about this, I'm excited, because I, I don't understand how to think about it myself. These local measures of growth based on night events, and these two guys that we use. I, I, I'm cons that, that it seems like a great opportunity, but it also seems like I, I'm concerned about the reliability in, in the sense that the, the relationship between economic welfare and night lights are fundamentally different depending on the type of growth Well, I've, I've read the literature. I haven't actually put this in any of the work I've done uh, uh, because we've, we've been using national uh, 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 states as unit of analysis uh, and then using uh, standard, standard uh, uh, pen, pen world tables. Uh, but it's so attractive uh, to be able to say, uh, uh, if you're if you're within fi if you're within 50 years 50 miles of the border, as opposed to being near the capital city, uh, and then things like Posner does, uh, looks at uh, who's the eth what's the ethnic group of the leader, where will the electricity lines go, and it's amazingly predictive <laughs> of where the electricity lines go, uh, it, but but that the the outcome variable is not uh, growth it's uh, it's <laughs> it's re rewards for being in the right ethnic group uh, so th this is problematic uh, and uh, but it's it's but this satellite data is too exciting uh, not to <laughs> not to use even if we're not entirely sure what it's measuring yes um, i'm a little concerned that you left out coups in one party states and that you emphasize civil wars in terms of uh, political instability. Um, why did not the other parts? Because there were many, many coups uh, for a very long time. And I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend the lecture last night, the second lecture. Uh, and maybe I'm going a little right to it. So one party states, states uh, are reflected in polity scores. And so when I say democracy, uh, 
uh, uh, as the outcome variable. One party, one party states with some degree of executive constraints tend to wind you up in this zone which I've called anocracy, somewhere between minus five and plus five. Uh, so I'm seeing one party states or observing one party states as an outcome uh, for which uh, we're seeking to explain that is lower levels, uh, lower, le lower levels of democracy and uh, greater difficulty of uh, opposition, uh, uh, opposition uh, groups to coordinate uh, uh, against uh, the incumbent. So on average, uh, in elections in the last 20 years or so, I forgot exactly what the time scale was, uh, but on average, uh, the number two party in African elections has been about 0.25, uh, uh, which means that most elections are non-competitive, uh, hegemonic parties, uh, or you can say one party, de facto one party states, uh, and the question becomes, uh, why don't you get coordination of the opposition, especially when the, uh, the dominant group uh, or the, or the uh, ruling group uh, is, uh, uh, is ineffectively uh, governing. Um, and uh, Leo Ariola has the best uh, book on answering this question uh, and looks at the cases where you do get effective uh, opposition. And as I've argued in the first lecture, uh, only if you get effective opposition uh, will you get some degree of accountability of uh, of uh, governing groups. That's right, that's right. In the second lecture, my idea was these are the symptoms, the coups, and, uh, and, the, um, and the lack of uh, uh, opposition, but not causal in the sense that they're endogenous to the, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to factors uh, that I try to outline today. Thank you very much. Thank you all.